Good morning. So here, this is Lake Titicaca. I spent a night here. So it's about, about a full day here. Um, in a hotel that, eh, so-and-so. Internet again in Peru, terrible. Uh, download speeds are okay, but upload speeds are like zero, near zero. 200 photos took six hours to upload. Yeah. Um, you just got, you got to get used to it. It's so frustrating. You know, I'm spending all my time um, doing, getting stuff ready, and then sending it to my other people to do because I can't upload. It's too. When you've got a really poor upload speed, it's too risky to break. Um, to break a, uh, a connection and then only parts of files get uploaded and stuff like that. Very frustrating. Um, so I'm going to talk today about preparing um, for a border crossing. Okay, so um, what I did the night, or a few days before, I always look up and, and see, sorry my bloody nose is itchy, um, and see experiences from other um, from other riders. I also chatted on uh, WhatsApp to some friends that have passed a few days earlier. Um, me, myself being an Australian citizen, I have to uh, I have to take note of what, I mean, as an example, this border crossing, it costs $160 in recip reciprocity fees. And what that means is the US charge Bolivians a fee to come to the US. If, if, they're, if, they're, if they're approved, they still pay, they pay a fee. So what happens is every US citizen that comes to Bolivia has to pay the fee. Now usually Australia follows suit and just does whatever US, the US does and just bends over and says, yeah, we'll do that for, with you as well. But um, this time, no, so I don't have to pay the fee, but I'm sure they're gonna try and get it out of me, um, you know. $160 is a month's wages for people in some of these countries. So anyway, so I do the research, find out what paperwork I need. You always, always need uh, copies of you know, title, registration, uh, driver's license, um, uh, passport. So you, you know you always should have in your in your backpack or your or your uh, in a secure waterproof bag um, have you know at least five copies of everything. Now, I, I got an international license, uh, uh, motorcycle license. However, I've never been asked for it, not once. They actually asked for the US one. Now, some other people have written and said, oh no, well, they'll, they'll ask. The US one means nothing to them, but it does. Um, I, every time they've asked, it's always been for the, um, for the, my, my uh, not my international, my local, my, my country one. So I've got, a, I've got two, two driver's license, one for the USA and one for Australia. Now, um, so basically once you've got all that paperwork in order, you, you go online and you look up and you read experience from other people. Now, if you know how to use Google, you know how to do a Google search and refine the results by recent, um, by, by, you know, the last year, you know. And there's SM Boiler Works has a really good one, um, uh, has a really good recent one. Um, but if you type this into Google, border crossing by motorbike, Peru, Bolivia, you'll see SM Boiler Works come up and they provide a fantastic description of, of the whole process they went through, which is just, I mean, incredible effort from those guys to do something that's so clear and concise with photos as well, which can be a little bit risky. But, you know, if you've got a good helmet cam and you know how to use your remote pretty well, you can get away with it. Um, so hopefully it's not going to be wet all the way through. Again, I've got a bit of a problem with my front tyre again, leaking, and it's causing me no end of issues. And uh, I'm just going to get a new front rim and uh, uh, get it shipped from Miami to to uh, San Diego, Chile. Uh, it's just not worth the risk of, of having serious problems in the middle of the desert with, you know, no water, no food, no one around to help you for a long time. So I'm just going to have to bite the bullet. I mean, it's been working well for about two weeks, three weeks. I uh, haven't hadn't been leaking and now it's slowly leaking again. Not a lot, but enough to, 
it uh, caused me some concern and have to keep looking and checking it. Uh, my, my computer tell, uh, gives me, I mean it's got tyre pressure sensors and gives me notification, tyre pressure front low, and so I then go check it and it's like down to, down to about 23 psi, which it should be around about 30 psi. Um, which, I mean in these conditions it's not, it's not a huge issue at that. Um, I have got a pump on board and once I get to the border and, un, uh, and unpack, I just wanted to get out of here. I'm going to uh, reinflate the tyre, um, get it back up, and then I'm going to just do a test to see over three or four days how how low it goes. Another thing too is I'm up at about 4,000 metres, so 12,000 feet, and uh, that's going to drop the pressure by a couple of points as well. So uh, not by six, seven or eight though. Uh, yesterday I was sitting on around about 26 psi, and now it's cold, and it will it will definitely go up, but not while I'm riding this slowly. Um, so it'll probably go up to about 25, 26 again. And it got up to 27, 28 yesterday, which is fine. I mean, I will ride with that every day. Um, in fact, it's probably, on these sort of roads, it's probably more advisable. Uh, just a, a couple of PSI off. Freaking slippery friggin' roads. You find this through every single town because trucks stop and go and... But anyway, so... So the, 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 step, the step I have to take today is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to immigration and get stamped out of, of Peru. Um, I'll have to provide my um, passport plus my tourist card um, and they'll uh, provide me with a copy. Um, I, I, and once I've done that, I'll just walk across the road to the Eduana which is what, where you get the Edwana is where you always get your, um, your vehicle import permit and I'll get that um, stamped out and then they'll give me a little bit of a section of that to prove that I've been stamped out to give to the Bolivian side of things and then the Bolivian side of things is going to be the slow part I'm hoping to get through the, the Peru side of things in 10 to 15 minutes um, and the Bolivian side of things might take an hour, might take two hours just got to always put it in your mind that you're, it's going to take time and just say well what the hell but usually you, you are doing something or waiting for someone during that period so it's not so bad the worst one i had was ecuador border coming into uh, peru where i just stood in a line for three hours and th and that believe me that is just so frustrating and so it just shows the incompetence of the ecuadorian uh, border patrol of just not knowing the days and times that they get busy and you know having like three or four booths out of 10 or 12 open and then also having a little buddy system on the door where the the guy who's shooing people in who's an arsehole um, is letting people go to the front of the queue all the time because they're friends of friends or whatever or it's not friends of friends it's people who are paying him he's got he's got a little system going where he probably brings in about 200 300 400 us dollars a day maybe even more so um, I hope they do something about, you know, the problem is they're probably all in on it. So he might be getting five or six hundred dollars a day and they're splitting it between six or eight people, you know. But uh, and that's, that's life in uh, Central and South America, Latin America. Um, yeah, so another thing you've got to do before you get to borders, and I mean Peru has probably got the most expensive fuel, uh, gas in petrol, whatever you want to call it. Gas is the most stupid term for uh, for fuel, but that's the way everyone in the US talks it, because it's not a gas, it's a liquid. Um, uh, so, um, I, I'm gonna make sure I fill up, um, I mean, I'm not gonna have any problem getting fuel, but I always make sure I try to, try to fill up as close to the border as possible, so I'm, that's not what I have to worry about. I don't have to worry about getting fuel once I get into the new country and a little bit of excitement, you know, uh, adding another one to your list, you know, I'm well over a hundred now and um, every one seems like a conquest and I'm a pretty happy happy camper about it, so but I will come back, I'll probably, I might come back and, uh, and pay for a tour uh, I might just skip past these people Only because there might be a little bit of a hill up ahead and the buses are slow up hills and I hate bus drivers with a passion.
Yeah, so I mean, this trip to the border is going to take me about two hours. Um, by that stage, I should be pretty much low on gas, so um, there is a town on the border where I can get gas. So I'll fill up there and spend the last of my pesos. Um, are my souls, sorry? Pesos, just. So yeah, it's always about concentrating on these roads too, you know, looking looking for the potholes. Now this guy's going to overtake, or normally that's what happens. They'll normally just overtake no matter what. Um, and you've just got to sit on the curbside, you know. It's frustrating sometimes, especially when they're buses where you're basically given no room and you've got like two saddlebags, two bags on the side on top of the cases that are actually wider than the cases, you know. I was thinking about getting uh, on the um, on the bike, getting a couple of flags out, just so I know the, the spacing. Because sometimes you get when you go through the page, the, the, uh, the where you've got to pay to go on the roads, the tolls, um, Sometimes they're pretty narrow for a motorbike, like they only allow motorbikes through there for free, but sometimes they're really narrow and I've got to basically walk the bike through it on an angle sometimes just to get it through. But I mean, it's not a big deal. So yeah. So this is the, this is at 4,000 metres by the way. <laughs> so I'm going to be at 4,000 metres most of the way and then drop down to about three and a half, three once I get into La Paz, I think La Paz is at about 3,000 metres. So therefore, you know, this is summer and it will be chilly. Um, like it's probably about five, five degrees uh, centigrade right now. Um, it's pretty cold, so that's like about 45 or something. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit. So yeah, I'm looking forward to, to Bolivia immensely. A couple of days, I've got to you know, clean up the bike, just do a little bit of maintenance, get just make sure I've got the oil right and uh, my coolant's getting low again. I've had issues with my coolant tank leaking under under high pressure. So when you get into when I'm been getting into cities um, and just sitting there in traffic, um, something with the ring on the on the coolant tank and and a and a shockingly terrible design flaw of the KTM 1290 is the accessibility. Basically, I've got to take off the off, off the protection bars, I've got to take off the panels um, and to get access to the to coolant. I mean, how they couldn't just put it in a spot where you can actually just undo the cap and fill her up is beyond belief. They say that you only need to change it once a year, but I've changed it five times on this trip. And believe me, it's a friggin' one and a half hour job, two hour job each time, where it should be like a two minute job. Well, the oil's not so bad, it's pretty. It's a pretty simple process. Um, and the brake fluid and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I'm full here and I'm getting a little bit low on the rear because I go a bit heavy on the rear um, in the mountains. Probably a little bit more than I should. But that's just experience. I'm getting a lot better at the... Shoot, the metal on the road. Um, I'm getting a lot better at the uh, at the mountains now. Just getting good lines and learning to brake early and then accelerate out. Um, yeah, so anyway, getting back to the border stuff. Uh, once I get through a border, I normally just take a few minutes, put everything together. I've got a Bolivia sticker in my passport to put on my bike. I've pre-purchased a few of them. Uh, I actually missed out on Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. As I was going through them, I just couldn't find any place that was selling stickers. And uh, I'm going to redo it all anyway when I get back to Miami and clear all the stickers off and then get all the same size stickers so it's all nice and uniform. And so I've got room for more because I'm running out of room now. Um, but uh, uh, it's um, hopefully Bolivia, hopefully the salt flats. It looks like I'm going to get some pretty good weather this weekend. Um, to do the salt flats, but it'll just depend. I'm going to try and see if I can get a tour going, go on a tour there, because uh, it's worth it. You know, it costs you, if you go on a group tour with other motorbike riders, adventure riders, it, you know, it might cost you like $50 or something, but it's a full day. And you get to see so many things you wouldn't normally see unless you really knew how to plan uh, a whole uh, journey and find all the spots you want to go to and find the spots that are accessible. 
I mean, even back there, Christopher, back in uh, in Cusco, Peru. I mean, he said, "Oh, we won't, we won't go on this road because it rained last night and it's uh, slippery as hell." Um, and to, you know, you, you you're definitely going to come off. He said. And he said, "I'm definitely going to come off too." So, um, well, he, he didn't actually say he'd come off. He said he might come off with a bit of a smile. Um, uh, yeah, so. I'm going to try and see if there is some sort of tour and uh, get the drone out and just do some fun shots like a lot of people do. I'm not going to do the, the boring, you know, put the motorcycle in your fingers bullshit. Not the leaning power of power piece of crap. Uh, it's been done for death. But I want to try a couple of different things with a drone over a couple of different days. Maybe some flyby work. Um, the problem is I'm not... Jesus, look at the size of this friggin' thing. Oh, my God. Normally you can take them at about 40, 40 k an hour, no problem, 50 k an hour. They love this here in Peru. They love all, all these statues. And some of them are pretty cool, but they do look a little bit tacky at the same time. Another thing to do uh, when, you, when you're looking for uh, fuel stops and pit stops is uh, is always, um, I mean, I know you, you can't use small businesses with fuel. Uh, the, the, the bad batches that I've had, I've only had a couple now. I had one in Peru that was a little bit choppy and uh, the bike didn't like it that much. Um, but the uh, you've got to stick with the brand companies. Because there's a lot of ones that are in, uh, you know, like in places like that where you drive around a bunch of rubble and there's a gas pump and stuff like that. Just not worth it. Um, uh, it's be best off to to find a reputable one. Because usually those older ones, their tanks are maybe got a bit of uh, a grit in them. These are friggin' amazing. Um, I mean, they're mountains. They're not topes. My gosh. They're called different names in every country, by the way. <laughs> you think they? You think you know, Spanish for one of those things, tope, would be suffice? But they have different words for them in every country. Well, not every country, but probably I've seen probably five or six different words for them. And they love them here in Peru. Eat like. You're, you're coming you're going up mountains or down mountains sorry and they'll put one on a near before a corner so you, to make people slow down to the corner probably corners where they've had multiple deaths and stuff like that but the multiple deaths have got nothing to do with uh, speed they're always to do with stupidity here the, the most stupid drivers I've ever met in my life like just you know they don't realize it that's a that's a better hope but I don't realize they're driving death machines you know they are hu human they're blocks one ton blocks of metal hurtling at 100 kilometers an hour and that's not just the young drivers here too they've got some weather up ahead not fun but anyway, that's uh, that's what I do, and I've, I also ramble on, obviously. Uh, that's what I do to prepare for um, for the stop. I, I also make sure I've got um, uh, plenty of water, plenty of uh, uh, drink on board, um, a couple of snack bars, always handy, because I don't normally eat until dinner time, so I just have a couple of snacks during the day. You wouldn't know it to look at me, but... I just have a couple of snacks during the day and have a nice meal at dinner time. Yeah. Hi guys, so I'm, uh, as you can as you can tell, I'm I'm getting closer and closer to the border uh, with uh, La Paz. Uh, sorry, to Bolivia, the Peru border crossing, um, and the town that I'm that, that, that I'm doing the crossing at is uh, Desaguadero, Desaguadero, and uh, it's. Uh, it's an interesting, interesting town. You sort of, it sort of comes up on you very quickly. Um, so you've got to be, you know, you're sort of like riding through a town and then all of a sudden, bang, you're at the border. So you've got to be, 
uh, ready for that. And I just parked my bike on the right hand side um, of the border. Um, so it's it's a it's a fairly quick border crossing, uh, getting through, getting out of uh, getting out of um, Peru, but uh, a little bit slower on the other side. Um, and I'll talk a bit a little bit more about that at, on the next video. Dreams are coming to destination easy to do. What a voice! What a voice! So I'm about 30 minutes from the uh, Bolivia border. A dream of mine. I've always uh, looked at the Bolivia and uh, the mountains and the salt flats and and always thought, geez, I'd love to go there one day. I never thought about doing it on a motorcycle until the last few years. But, um, hey, it's an adventure. I love these little towns. I'd like to know when some of these walls were built. I'd say probably maybe 100, 150 years ago. They're definitely not going back that far. But this is all, this is all the breadbasket of Peru, where this is where all the crops are grown and the Lake Titicaca, that's where all the fish are farmed, they've got you know, salmon farms. I mean I didn't even realise, I, I saw the farms out there, I didn't know whether they were oyster salmon, whatever they were, they were from a distance. But this morning a small little tiny boat came in, carrying 15 times 25, uh, 325 kilograms of salmon and, I, and I'm thinking, there's no way known they could have caught that. They had, they had nets in the boat. I asked the guy, he goes, oh no, we own a fish farm. <laughs> I thought, shit. Uh, but anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm starting to run low on fuel, which is good. So, Desiguani, Desiguani, or whatever it's called. And I haven't seen one sign that's told me how far it is to it, but it, it was about two hours away from what I could gather. And I'm... Uh, I'm about an hour and a half, hour, hour and 40 minutes into the trip. Uh, I've had three buses pull out in front of me today, so I'm a little bit edgy around them, freaking idiots. One of them I just had to break solidly. Just went, went across the road. Do, you know, go, go do a U thing, U turn. And he just pulled out right in front of me. Sheep on one side, the cattle on the other. They move the cattle every day to, to different, um, probably multiple times a day, to different areas where they can get some feed. I don't know whether they own any of the land they take them to, but I don't, I don't think it matters that much. Around these parts, I think they all share and share alike. Anyway, I'll put the video on once I get to the border again and see how I go. So there, this is the this is a picture of the border on the on the um, on the Bolivian side, and this is where you come into the town, and basically you just hit the border straight away. Um, so it's a little bit uh, a little bit annoying. Um, this is one of the security guys. I had this. He he held onto my helmet and that and. That, and uh, it, it kept taking photos. This is not me. This is another guy holding it. And that's crossing the bridge from the Bolivia side across to, uh, sorry, the Peru side across to the Bolivian side. Okay, so that was, uh, this is me now entering Bolivia. I've already gone through the checkpoint. Um, so basically you go to, on the Bolivia, on the Peru side, you, you stop up on the right-hand side and there's the aduana and immigration to the left. Immigration took 10 minutes. Um, the, aduana, I would have the aduana would have taken 10 minutes, but I had to sit in an office waiting for someone to serve me. And then they said, oh, in or out? And I was going out. And then they said, oh, give me the papers. And they just stamped it and I left. So I waited about 20 minutes in there. 
for nobody. This is the guy wanting to check my paperwork, and I didn't realise I had another stop. Um, I'd already had a stop across the bridge after I'd just left, and now as a second. And he's just asking me where I'm going, uh, where I'm going to, uh, and just wants to wanted to have a look at my papers. But then I think he just basically said, um, yeah, you can get going. So, all pretty cool. I thought I'd have to go and get all my papers out of my backpack again, but I didn't have to. So, the first thing you're going to know when you get to uh, Bolivia is the gas station problem. Uh, some of the gas stations, the first ones I went to, didn't have any fuel. And so there, I think I stop off here for a second, just get my stuff together. Um, but um, didn't have, um, yeah, didn't have the, um, let's get my gloves back on. Um, yeah, they didn't have fuel, so I'm starting to really worry. And another issue you're going to have with Bolivia, if you're a tourist and you've got an imported bike, they can charge you pretty much whatever they want, and they get the calculator out. There's a normal fee for locals, for citizens, and then they have this thing where they're allowed to charge you what they want, and it's normally about half again. So if it's $3 a gallon, it's $4.50. A gallon anywhere up to eight dollars a gallon they'll try and fleece you for which is friggin just disgusting and it's so frustrating and they'll they'll as soon as you pull into a gas station they'll look at your, your number plates um, but the first time it happened this guy wanted eight you know eight about eight eight dollars a, a, a gallon and I just said no 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 and then he got the calculator again and then I just gave him money that was just a little bit more and then I just drove off. I just thought I'm not putting up with this crap. And uh, I had this problem all through Bolivia, where some gas stations wouldn't even serve you. They'd say no, 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 no gas, no gas. And then you'd see other cars putting gas in. So it was a real bitch of a situation uh, all throughout Bolivia. Um, we never not had issues, and and they were always running out of gas. Uh, the, the gas stations, and um, it became an exercise in patience. Um, you know, and it, it, there's just no need for it. I mean, they, they look, the government subsidises the gas for the citizens, fair enough. Um, but they should have to, they should have a rule what they, the, the, an exact fee they charge for any imported vehicles, and then it's fine. So what a lot of people do is they, they get gas cans and they get locals to go and fill up with gas and fill up their gas can, cans, and then they do that. So there's all ways around it. So as soon as the governments do something stupid, you create another market for other people doing, you know, getting away with it. So it just really annoys me. But um, the the border crossing. So once I got out of Bolivia, I stopped on these boom gates, these yellow boom gates, and I've written it on my blog. Uh, you stop at these yellow boom gates. You go across the road to get out of Peru. You go into immigration, hand in your tourist card and your passport, and then after that, what you do is you then have to go. To, there's a building to the left of that that's got a gate and a security guy at the gate. You've got to wait at the gate for the security, for them to let you through to get stamped out, get your uh, import permit stamped out. Um, and that took me probably about 30 minutes. It took me about 10 minutes to get through immigration. Even though it was a bit of a line, it went fairly quickly. Um, and then you, then you get on your bike, you cross the bridge. And once you get across the bridge, there's a big blue building in the middle of the road. You park your bike right at the front of the building as you enter and just park your bike there, then you go to the left of the building as you're facing it, and then it, around the middle of the building there's a, there's a little booth, you go to that booth, you get, your, uh, you get a tourist card you've got to fill in, and then you join the line for immigration. I, I was a bit unlucky that I had, and there's a, there's a, there was a photo of that, the line that I had, I had two buses in front of me, so basically I waited about, it took me 90 minutes, an hour and a half to get through that side of the border, uh, and just waiting in line. For, for people to, uh, you know, for them to process all the other people. And once I got in there, because I'm an Australian citizen, I didn't have to pay uh, any fee to get into uh, Bolivia. Um, but US citizens, because what happens is they're called recipro reciprocity fees. Um, and if, if the US, anytime you see that, it's when your company country charges them to come into your country, they say, oh, well, bugger it, we'll charge your citizens. So it's a stupid thing that just cost people who travel money. 
and it's $160 for US citizens, which is quite a lot, you know. Um, and so I didn't have to pay that fee because Australia, for, for once, didn't follow the US lead and, and charge a fee, which they normally do. I had an issue in Brazil a few years ago where they basically charged me, they, 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 they announced a new fee as I was travelling and then basically my travel agency that, that organised it didn't tell me about it. And uh, so basically I, I was kicked out of the country. I had to go back and then because you, you, I couldn't purchase it in, in the country, I had to be out of the country to purchase it. So I actually flew in and then I had to fly back out. Really good fun. So, um, yeah, so I, you join in the line and then you, you basically, uh, you, you do your immigration, get stamped in. That, that took like, you know, 70 minutes, uh, 60, 70 minutes. And then you go back around the front of the building where you parked your bike and that's where the iguana is. That took about 10, 15 minutes. And then they, they, they get all the paperwork off you. All the normal paperwork is the same with everyone. Copies of registration title, driver's license, passport, photo page, um, and then a copy of your, your permit you're getting out of Peru, uh, the one you got out of Peru, and then they just process it all and give you the documents to get into uh, Bolivia. So that only took about 20 minutes uh, all up to do that. And then I was on my way. Um, I didn't have that far to go. I only had about an hour once I crossed the border to get to get to uh, to um, La Paz, which is quite a. I mean, if, if if it was a clean city, it's it's in a it's in an amazing place. Like it'd be a world heritage site. It, the, it's like in a valley with these great. Can it's like a, it's like a mini Grand Canyon you're in, and it's pretty cool. Um, and I stayed at a place called the Overland Blog. Um, at the Over, Overland Hotel, sorry. And then right below that, right below the Overland, was uh, a, a place called Bolivia Moto, Motorbike Tours Bolivia. And um, I ended up chatting to a guy there and organising someone to take me the following day up to Death, Death Road, which I, I, was, I wanted to do, but I wasn't 100% sure whether I'd have the time to do it. Um, and, but once I started chatting to this guy, he rang a couple of people and we ended up getting a guy named Tito, and that'll be the next video, the death row, which will be a long video because it was absolutely sensational. In, in fact, the, this Tito guy took us all these back roads, so we, we bypassed the city, but we went up these crazy mountains. Um, it was a lot more dangerous than death road was. Um, a lot more scary, I should say. I don't think it was that dangerous because we weren't going fast. It was a lot of mud and dirt and you know, this grey slush and my bike is not that not much fun in that so I'll talk about that in the next video but it was a fantastic day and what happened was Chris this guy I met on the Star Rat ship to from Panama to Cartagena uh, he was staying pretty close to where I am right now uh, uh, but across on a lake in Bolivia and I messaged him and he said oh shit I'll come too so we ended up going halves in the uh, in the price. It was one hundred and twenty dollars for the for the for the for the day, and it started at like really early in the morning, like eight a.m. We left and we got back at six p.m. and it was absolutely sensational day. One of the highlights of my highlights of my trip. This is going into one of the into one of the gas stations where they say no, we don't have any gas. Um, I'm pretty sure they told me no, and. Uh, away I had to go again. So you, they put the cones there where there's no gas and uh, I get told no gas and and I have to keep going again. So right now I probably had um, I, I probably had uh, about, I, I had enough gas to get, get to La Paz but you know it was still painful um, and I also had problems with this memory card as well so a lot of the videos I shot for the day actually didn't turn out didn't turn out for me so on the road I went again and I ended up getting into a to a, a gas station closer to uh, La Paz normally I get gas before before I get to the border uh, I gas up but there was just no gas stations open or had, with any gas so yeah so a little bit painful though right now I've got probably about I can see it right there on the dial I've probably got about I'm down to the last two two lines, so I've probably got about 100 miles, which was enough to get me to La Paz. But 
still a little bit nervy, you know, you don't want to be getting really low on gas. And I only probably had about an hour, an hour and a half to go to get to La Paz. So this is La Paz. Um, stunning, absolutely stunning city. It's a little bit dirty, the, the actual city city. There's some nice areas of the city. But as you can see, there's rain coming in and there's sunshine and then, but it's, it's in a canyon. Um, yeah, crazy. So I stayed a little bit out of that. This is the area where I stayed. St stunning, absolutely stunning area. Uh, this is a girl, her name was Dominica. Uh, she's going around on, on a Skoda, like a little, uh, little, little bike around the world. And she's been traveling for years and she writes about it. She's actually really popular on uh, Facebook and stuff like that. But this is the hotel where I stayed, which is pretty basic. Um, but it was nice. The rooms were nice. It was only like $50 a night. Uh, Wi-Fi terrible again. There's a restaurant across the road. Uh, there's a bar and a restaurant. And it was a little bit of a complex. It had a barbecue area and all that sort of stuff. But it was pretty basic. There's her motorbike next to mine. Uh, yeah, but I was, Chris was going to meet me here in the morning. Uh, so anyway, guys, uh, questions and comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video. We'll talk soon.